Chapter Four of the Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. In 1806, Napoleon had decreed that young men studying for holy orders would be exempt from military duties. In 1807 and 1808, Father Bailey had sent Jean Marie's name as such a student, but in 1809 he forgot to do so. So, in early October of that year, Jean Marie was notified that on the 26th of that month he was to report at the military barrack at Lyons the nearest large city, and began his military service. Although that was the year Napoleon established the University of France, he was much less interested in educational work than he was in raising an immense army to keep his enemies in check. And for that war, unpopular with most of the people of France, he needed more, and ever more, men. "'But students for the priesthood are exempt from service,' protested Mrs. Vianney when she heard the news. "'They are,' Jean-Marie agreed, but for some reason my name was left off the list. I'll hire a substitute for you, Mr. Vianney promised. Jean-Marie expressed neither agreement nor disagreement with that plan. His father at once set about finding a young man who, for a sum of money, was serving Jean-Marie's place. Any luck? Mrs. Vianney would ask each day when her husband came home. None. All the young men I can find have either served already or don't care to do so now. But one day he came home smiling happily. On a farm some distance from Dardilly, he had found a boy willing to substitute for Jean-Marie. Vianney's household was happy again, and Jean-Marie was deep in the studies which came so hard to him. But on the morning of the 25th, when Mrs. Vianney opened the kitchen door, she found a package and a note on the doorstep. The package was filled with coins. The note made her gasp. "'What is it, mother?' Catherine was worried by the shock on her mother's face. What's all the money for, and what does the note say? The young man who was to substitute for Jean Marie, said Mrs. Vianney with a little sob. He came during the night and returned the money your father paid him, because he has changed his mind and does not care to serve. Changed his mind? Catherine was aghast. But he can't. He has, her mother repeated. And that means that Jean Marie... Yes, it means that Jean-Marie must stop his studies and serve in the army. The news depressed the whole family, and Mrs. Vianney was especially distressed when, toward evening, Jean-Marie became sick with a burning fever. You can't possibly go tomorrow, she said. You should be in bed until this fever has left you. I must go, mother, her son said firmly. When Jean-Marie arrived at Lyons, he was told that he would train at Bayonne. Before his detachment was ready to leave, however, he was in the hospital. He had always been eager to do any job assigned him, and now, even though he was in the army against his wishes, he fretted at the confinement and inactivity of the sick room. Out of bed by November 12th, he marched with his detachment, but he was still far from well, and when they stopped en route to Rouen, he was again thrust into the hospital, suffering from a violent chill. However, the officer in command had been given a certain number of recruits to deliver at Bion, and when in early January he was told to take his unit on, Jean-Marie, though not yet recovered, was ordered to leave the hospital and move with them. On the evening of January 5th, therefore, he crawled out of his bed, dressed, and started over to the captain's office to get his marching papers. On the way he passed a church and stopped in for a short visit. The church was cold and dark, lighted only by the little glow of the sanctuary lamp, and Jean-Marie, as usual, was sad that so few people had stopped in to call at God's house. He said a few prayers of love and reparation for the coldness of others. He spoke of his longing for the priesthood, and asked for help in this strange life in which he now found himself. It was hard for him to tear himself away, but at last he did. He came out of the church quite unaware of the amount of time he had spent there. He hurried to the captain's office, and found it closed for the night. At first he was distressed and could see no way out of his difficulties. He was supposed to march with his unit in the morning. He could not march without orders, and he could not get orders because the captain had left for the night. I should have come here first, he berated himself. Then when I had the papers, I could have spent all the time I wanted to in church. I should have remembered that the office closes at six o'clock. Remembered? How could I when I have no memory, no brain at all, I sometimes think. After a few minutes of such turmoil, he settled down and tried to think of a way out of the dilemma. Of course, he smiled. Why am I so upset? I'll get up at dawn tomorrow, be there when the office opens, and have my papers by the time the unit is ready to move. He did get up at dawn, was there when the office opened, and got his papers promptly. 
but there was one thing wrong with his plan. His unit had marched an hour before sunrise. The captain was furious. And so, recruit Vianney, you feel that the army should be round to suit your convenience? No, indeed, sir. You were told to come here last evening for your marching papers, I believe. Yes, sir. Then why didn't you come? I did, sir, but the office was locked. Why didn't you come earlier, or did you think I should wait here until it pleased you to arrive? Oh, no, sir. I started early, but I stopped in the church on the way, and... In the church? What are you, an old woman preparing for her last end, or a man preparing to be a soldier of France? France will need help, surely, if this is the kind of recruits we get. Red-faced with anger, the captain looked at Jean-Marie's paper spread before him. I see you have been in the hospital, he said. You were supposed to have ridden on one of the wagons because the doctors thought you were not fit to march. Well, you'll march now and at double quick time. He scrawled a few lines on a sheet of paper. Your unit has started for Beyond on the clermont ferrand road, he said. You will set out immediately, follow, and overtake them. At the first long halt, you will report to the sergeant in charge. Heavy-hearted, Jean-Marie started off. He was still a recruit, had not been sworn into the army yet, so he had no uniform. But he did have his heavy regulation pack, which seemed to grow heavier each mile he covered. As a child driving his father's sheep or running errands for his mother, it had always been his custom to say the rosary as he walked along the road. He started now, saying Hail Mary's, begging for strength for the ability to overtake his unit. The cold wind cut his face and made more difficult the breathing which was already painful because of his weakness and exertion. The strap of his heavy pack cut into his shoulder, and the road seemed full of round stones lying in wait to roll underfoot and twist the ankle of the hurrying recruit. He had had no breakfast. At first he had not minded this. When noon came, however, he realized that his weakness was not being helped by his fast. The sun passed overhead and was moving down the western sky. Lengthening shadows announced that the day was nearing its close. Jean-Marie, each time he climbed a small hill, would anxiously scan the road as far ahead as he could see. A large group of marching men, accompanied by several wagons, would stir up an identifying cloud of dust, a cloud that the recruit hoped with all his might he would soon locate. Each time he had a hill to climb, therefore, the ascent was made a trifle easier by the hope in his heart. But each time he reached a crest and found nothing, disappointment became harder. A horseman approached, coming from the direction in which Jean-Marie was going. The boy hailed him. "'Have you seen a detachment of troops on the road?' he asked. "'Yes, some time ago, about two hours, perhaps. Why?' "'I am supposed to overtake and join them.' "'On foot?' The man was unbelieving. "'That wouldn't be possible. I've ridden two hours since I saw them.' and they used the same two hours to march in the other direction. He looked with sympathy at the sick, tired boy. Better give it up, he advised. You'll never make it. The horseman cantered off about his business, and Jean-Marie looked longingly after him. Then he settled his pack so it was less uncomfortable, and began slogging ahead. There was no hope of hurrying now. Just to keep going took all his strength of will and of body. Birds flew overhead, returning to their nest for the night. A man drove a yoke of oxen across the road, bringing them back to their barn after a day in the fields. Jean-Marie was glad to be compelled to stop for a moment, as the lumbering animals went their way. When they had gone, it was very still. The day was over, and man and beast were preparing to rest. A single star appeared, cold and far away, and at last Jean-Marie accepted the obvious fact that he was not going to overtake his unit before they reached Bayonne. He finished another decade of his rosary, put the bees into his pocket, and looked about him for a place to spend the night. The rutted fields at either side of the road did not offer much in the way of shelter or comfort, but at the far corner of one of the fields, an untouched stand of trees marched the beginning of a forest. Jean-Marie decided to bed down there, rest his weary bones, and get a little sleep if he could. The fallen leaves of other seasons would make a satisfactory mattress. For a pillow he would use his pack. He knelt to begin his night prayers. Hello, who are you? Jean-Marie started. He had heard no one approaching, and he looked about to find the speaker. It was some moments before he distinguished a young fellow of about his own age standing among the trees. Hello, he said. I am Jean-Marie Vianney from Darterly. And what are you doing here? I am saying my prayers, answered the literal Jean-Marie. 
You came all the way from Dardily to say your prayers? Oh, oh no, I am here because I am a recruit in the army, and... The army? The stranger looked about him uneasily. Where is your unit? I thought you were alone. I am alone. Jean-Marie told his story to the stranger who listened with interest. Then you are not really anxious to serve in the army? No, I'm not, Jean-Marie agreed, but I was called up and I have a duty. Well, come along with me for tonight, anyway. I'll find a more comfortable place for us to sleep. Jean-Marie rose. Thank you, sir. Call me Guy, never mind the rest, he added hastily, as he saw Jean-Marie about to ask his family name. Jean-Marie stooped to pick up his pack, but when Guy saw the effort it required, he lifted it himself and swung it easily over his own broad shoulders. This way, he said, and strode off through the woods. It seemed to the exhausted Jean-Marie that he followed his guide for hours through dense forests, up hills, down steep declivities, through streams. He had about reached the limit of his strength, when they came to a clearing in the center of which was a small house. Guy strode over and rapped on the heavy door. For some moments there was no response. Then, through a window, they could see a slight flare as of a lantern being lighted. The door opened a crack, and a man's voice asked, Who is it? It is Guy. I want to talk with you. The door opened wider, and Jean-Marie saw the householder lifting the lantern high so that its rays would fall on Guy's face. Over the man's shoulder was the frightened face of his wife, peering out to see who had disturbed them so late in the night. There was a long, low-toned conversation. Then Guy turned and spoke. You can sleep here tonight, Jean-Marie, he said. And in the morning I will. We will see what happens in the morning, interrupted Guy gruffly. Thoroughly spent, young recruit Vianney slept heavily, so heavily that it was well after dawn before stir and movement in the house awakened him. When he realized where he was, remembered what had happened the day before, a wave of depression surged over him. He did not want to be in the army. He wanted to study for the priesthood. He had no affection for Napoleon Bonaparte, now self-crowned Emperor of France, no sympathy for the unjust war he was waging. But he had been summoned to serve in the army, and knew that his duty directed him to obey. He started out to do his duty, and through his own stupidity, as he saw it, had landed in an awful mess. He cringed at the thought of being brought to Bayonne in handcuffs, yet he was sure that would be the fate of a deserter, even an unintentional one. He had no appetite for the breakfast offered by the couple who had sheltered him, but he took it, feeling it would be ungracious to refuse. They asked about his home and family, and told him that they had been married the previous year. "'I am a shoemaker by trade,' said the man of the house. "'But I am not doing so well, because there are few people now who have the money to buy shoes.' "'We would be happy to have you stay with us,' the wife put in shyly. "'But we do not always have food enough for ourselves.' "'Stay here? I couldn't do that, anyway,' said Jean-Marie gloomily. "'I must move on.' "'Yes, I will take you myself to the home of Mr. Fayot, our mayor,' said the young host. "'Must I go there?' Jean-Marie saw himself berated by the head of a local government, handcuffed, set off in disgrace. "'It will be best. Come, let's get started.' Jean-Marie thanked his hostess for her kindness, shouldered his pack, and followed his host through the forest. "'The mayor does not live in the town of Nuez, where the town hall is, but in this settlement of Robins. Here is his house.' Recruit Vianney remained in the yard, miserable and somewhat frightened, while his companion went in to talk to Mr. Fayot. It seemed a long wait, but before Jean-Marie had finished the second decade of his rosary, the front door of the house opened, and a pleasant-faced middle-aged man came out. "'Well, Jean-Marie,' he said, "'we have been planning how we can dispose of you.' d d d d dispose of me?' quavered Jean-Marie with visions of scaffold and guillotine before his eyes. "'Yes, I already have two young men living in my barn, and I think it would not be wise to have a third. But my cousin's widow, Claudine Fayot, will be happy to shelter you, I know. But, sir, perhaps you don't understand. I am a recruit. I stupidly missed my unit. I am at this moment supposed to be in Vion. Too many young men are having their lives disrupted by a war which has gone on too long, which seems to us to have no justice in it, said Mr. Fayot firmly. There are many men in these parts who do not feel bound to answer the self-crowned emperor when he calls. Do you think that is right? Jean-Marie was troubled because obedience to authority had been instilled in the Vianney children from the cradle. 
Of course it is right. France needs young men at home, not dying in foreign lands in an unjust war. Mr. Fayot spoke very positively, and Jean-Marie assured himself the mayor was the person in authority, a representative of the government. If you think it is best for me to stay here, he began uncertainly. I know it is best, said the mayor. End of chapter 4 Recording by Maria Therese